In Falmouth, Massachusetts, on Cape Cod, there is a wonderful chamber orchestra, professional chamber orchestra. Chamber orchestras, of course, have 40 members as opposed to 80 or 100 for a full symphony orchestra. But they're noted for their clarity of sound and the intimacy that they present to an audience. The Simonson Pignetta has been playing in Falmouth, at Falmouth Academy in Falmouth, Mass for approximately 10 years now. Four times a year, or five times a year, they come together with musicians from Providence, Boston, Cape Cod to form this gem of an orchestra. Saturday, March 31st, 2012, at 7.30 in Falmouth Academy, they will have their third concert of the season. It's a very interesting program. Symphonically, it spans from voice. I always remember voice because when I was living in New York many years ago, I went to Sam Goody's, and when we were still buying LPs, it said eight voice symphonies for $5.99. I thought, eight symphonies for $5.99, that's a great deal. How can you pass that up? And that was my introduction to voice. The symphonies were all totally charming, and I listened and listened and listened to that record and always smiled that I had never heard of voice before. Voice is sometimes considered late Baroque, early classical, these were small gems of symphonies that were composed. And number five will be on the program on Saturday night. At the other end, almost, of the symphonic spectrum is Haydn Symphony number 104. It's his last symphony and extremely complex, very, very interesting work. So within this one hour and a half program, you get one end and the other end of this early period of classical symphonies. But that's not all that happens. Um, as Stephen Simon, the conductor, music director, often puts together interesting programs, this concert also, sandwiched in between, includes Carl Maria von Weber, known perhaps for his opera, the Preischutz, um, wrote a concertino for clarinet and orchestra. He also wrote a concerto for clarinet and orchestra, but the concertino is especially beautiful, extremely difficult, and certainly, I would say, the top inspiration for anyone playing the clarinet. So any clarinet student should certainly know this work. And finally, there's the very interesting work by the American contemporary composer, Ellen Toffitz Willich. It was commissioned for the Handel Tricentennial by Maestro Simon when he was conducting at the Kennedy Center. And it was commissioned for the Handel Festival Orchestra, or I think it had changed its name at that point to the Washington Chamber Symphony. So it was premiered at the Kennedy Center in 1985. It's based on the first movement of Handel's D major violin sonata. And they are playing this first movement first before they play the Zwillich so that you can hear how the original has been transformed by Zwillich for this work, which is a very beautiful contemporary work which I think everyone will enjoy. So it's a, a mixed bag of programs of really wonderful pieces that have all been put together to create what I think will be a wonderful evening. We're very happy at this point to have with us the soloist, Mark Miller, clarinetist, who is the principal clarinetist for the Simon Vignetta and also for the Cape Cod Symphony, and Maestro Simon himself. Thank you. It's a great privilege to have Mark Miller with us. Now, the clarinet at this point in music history is a new instrument. It was still in the symphony orchestra an up and coming, new fangled piece of equipment, um, and people were just beginning to warm to it, uh, including uh, Carl Maria von Weber, who wrote the concertino. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's interesting how the clarinet was used so inconsistently in, in music at yes. that time. So Mozart. Very few Mozart symphonies have clarinet parts at all. However, he wrote us one of the top, one of the best concertos <laughs> in, in existence. Yes. Uh, he wrote us a beautiful uh, chamber work, the quintet for That's the right. strings, and he used the clarinet very imaginatively in his operas. Yes. Uh, you look at Haydn, the clarinet parts in the symphonies are, are pro forma. Uh, however, the creation has wonderful clarinet oh, parts. Oh, it does, yes. So I think composers were trying to figure out the clarinet's place in things over this time. Was it popular in its day, this work? Um, yes, it was, because Behrman was popular. It, it was written, written, as many things were, for a popular virtuoso. Um, 
this piece, I think, is so typical of the, the uh, uh, for, for the instrument that uh, they, Weber, or von Weber, he's, he was royalty after all, the, the Fond gave him uh, social credibility. And um, the, the piece is so inclusive, it's only about, what, 12 minutes? Something? If that. If that. And encompasses the entire range of the instrument. He clearly had um, goals in mind when he composed, composed the piece. Yes. Um, it's interesting in that uh, we were talking yes. earlier about the, fa the fact that if you can play the clarinet, you can play the concertino. There's nothing about it that, uh, that requires technique above and beyond just being able to play the instrument very well. But but that very well itself, is very important. In itself is something. Um, so Mark, when somebody says the Weber Concertino, what's the first thing that comes to mind in your head? Practice. Could you play it? <laughs> Billy's first concerto is what comes to mind, because it's one of the earliest pieces we teach. Uh -huh. uh, pieces of, of any sort of stature beyond, beyond student works. Mm -hmm. um, because it, it really does everything you need to do. Uh, it, it works on playing evenly, it works on playing with articulation, it works on playing lyrically. Uh, soft, loud, bottom of the range, top of the range. Uh, I mean, it's just a wonderful and very idiomatic exploration of the range of the clarinet. There, there were clarinet concertos written by Stamitz, by Spohr. They're not very idiomatic. The Spohr, in particular, are just, just empty displays of, of technique. But, Would you be willing to play a, a theme from it? Sure. Um, it is an introduction and then a theme in variations. He doesn't write too many variations. It's not very academic. Mm -hmm. um, the introduction, we haven't talked about this yet, but That's right, <laughs> the yeah. introduction I've always thought of as an operatic mad scene. Absolutely. It's, it's Please say it. <laughs> um, it. It starts very softly. for having had a little bit of an outburst. <laughs> and the introduction, the introduction continues in that vein. Uh, then there's a theme. And a set of variations on that theme. If we started variation on the on the same uh, series of chords I'm playing short bits because uh, we want people to come to the concert <laughs> if our notes were we'll get sad almost mock sad in the lowest range series of, of, of uh, six eight variations at the end to the typical clarinet arpeggio work <laughs> Yeah, but um, it's a it's a fabulous piece of music. 
it, it is very well constructed, very well written for the instrument, makes sense to the listener. And a lot of people don't even know who Carlo Maria von Weber was. I mean, he's not a major composer. Right, known, known only, I think, um, mainly for the Say a few words about the Zulich. Sure. Um, when the Handel Tricentennial was, was on its way, and the what was then the Handel Festival Orchestra in Washington, D.C., uh, was holding forth there. Um, I thought we needed to commission a work to honor the occasion. And Ellen Zwillich, who was then a violinist in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, uh, and really on her way as a major American composer, uh, came to mind. I asked her if she would compose a work for the orchestra that we could take on tour. We had a European tour scheduled for that season. And she decided then to base her piece on the first movement uh, of the Handel D Major Violin Sonata, which she had played as a violinist early on, and all, I guess all violinists play that piece at some point in their lives, and used that as her base for the inspiration for her five movement work and proceeded to compose the Concerto Grosso uh, 1985, which is its title, and uh, it's all built on the opening movement of that, of that work. Even though Ellen called it a Concerto Grosso and dated it uh, in honor of Handel's tricentennial, um, it's not really a concerto grosso, although there are winds in it, which certainly were not the case in, in Handel's day. His concerto grossi were mostly for strings, except for two oboes and a bassoon occasionally. And um, the clarinet, of course, had not been invented yet. So it gives uh, some context to Ellen's piece, uh, which uh, is just terrific. Um, I have performed it on tour, and it's a wonderful opportunity to bring it to, to Falmouth. And it, no, it is not wildly contemporary uh, pots and pans music, we often call it. It is not of that, of that ilk. It is uh, lyric, and it even has a written out harpsichord part in it. This third concert of the 2011-2012 season for Simon Sinfonietta will take place at Falmouth Academy in Falmouth, Massachusetts, which is on Cape Cod. The program begins at 7.30. For more information, go to our website, simonsinfonietta.org.